Hi everyone, today's video is categorized under Competitive Insights, which as the name implies, basically involves uh, my opponent and myself running uh, tier 1 decks, and there will be a substantially more um, competitive analysis and much less of um, jank in the deck. That means you probably won't see any uh, off, the, off the wall cards. So the matchup today is Food Coats vs Prepaid Kit. Uh, this is the prepaid kit variant that Noah ran at Worlds uh, this year that contains David in place of Parasite Data Soccer and it's pretty effective against food codes, let's see how I deal with it um, I keep my opening hand not um, single Ichi is not very good in my opening hand um, it's usually good to keep such an opening hand because there are no agendas and there's a money card but uh, unfortunately I'm definitely Rather, I'm definitely not able to defend my money. The Adonis is very easy to trash and I do not have uh, any good eyes to de defend it. And the Ichi doesn't defend R&D either as well. So I had to mulligan there, risking uh, an early agenda flood. So this is not the best of hands, but there are two money cards and a Turing. So that is something that I'm immediately going to capitalize on. I did not install the Turing because I'm using Eve. Um, it is very unlikely that my opponent will run, let alone trash the E campaign. So I can afford to not install the Turing, wait for next turn to install the Turing. So more importantly, I get to click for a credit and install the Assassin on R&D, which is very important. This means I can actually rest the Assassin if he decides to do anything funny. Had he ran R&D instead of HQ there, as you saw, I would not have rest the Assassin because I did not want to go all the way to zero credits. I wanted to rest the E. I would only rest the Assassin if... Yeah, as I said, he does something funny like installing medium, but that's probably not going to happen. So the other important reason for um, not re not raising assassin is that I want to raise the Turing on the Eve, and he goes for my Eve, which is the right thing to do, and f is forced to spend three clicks to trash the Eve, which means I'm coming out ahead because this means I can install the Adonis in the remote server, and he cannot keep spending his entire turn just to trash my money assets. He's down to zero credits, he can't do anything. Um, so yes, he dirty laundries ar uh, archives instead because he's very afraid of architect. And I abused this window to score Vitruvius instead. That wasn't a money asset in the remote, that was a Vitruvius. I was being very sneaky, but I'm going to pay the ultimate price for it because I go below four credits, I cannot threaten an architect res, he can make a me. It is a risk I had to take. Not really, I didn't have to take it, but I was very afraid that um, Kate would get set up faster than me. So, and I was also getting somewhat agenda flooded. I mean, I could have cycled with Jackson, but I think I should take scoring windows when I can. Anyway, looking at it another way, um, if there are agendas on the top of R&D, it's not like I'm going to score them anytime soon, because my remote server is occupied by Adonis, should I have chosen to go for it anyway. So I think I made the right move there. We both get two points, which isn't the end of the world for me, and I'm still able to set up my econ engine. <clears throat> While my op opponent is still struggling to find his SMC. He is getting quite a bit of money, which is a problem, but at least he doesn't have his breakers out yet, so I can afford to spend a couple turns stabilizing. Generally as HB, you do want to stabilize it against the likes of criminals and some shapers, because the longer you drag the game out, the more likely you are to find your Ash and Caprice. This means that Food Coats is actually most effective in the mid game, where your opponent typically um, has just set up their breakers, doesn't have too much money, and you found your Ash or Caprice, you can actually start sliding agendas into your remote. They cannot afford to run your remote every single turn. So I'm. Um, this is a very good time because I've just found my Ash, or, well, not just, but I found my Ash, which means that. Now with an upgrade in the remote server, I can begin sliding anything I want in that server and my opponent is forced to play guessing games at that point. Uh, of course R&D is the safer route, this is why I always ensure that R&D is well protected. In this case, I have two unrest eyes on it, so a single SMC won't cut it. He cannot play, uh, do something like a same old maker's eye on R&D right now. I mean he could, he has quite a lot of money, he has double clone chip, he certainly could get into R&D if he wants to. So I'm definitely considering the Christian Vrid on R&D right now. That seems like a very appropriate line of action to take. Um, yep. Do I do it? Well, 
first I overdraw with Jackson. This finds me my breaker bay grid, which is very key. This immediately goes into the scoring server. Helping me to res Ash and Caprice for free is definitely something that I want to get accomplished. And I'm going to bait him into running my remote server by placing an Eve in there as well. So this looks like a very stacked server. It looks like I'm trying to rush out an ABT. Um, I think you wouldn't be too surprised if it really turns out to be an ABT in the remote. And I think as the runner, you kind of do have to go for it. And indeed, my opponent does. When in fact, it's all bait. So he's on 21 credits. I'm also on 21 credits. So this is not going to lead anywhere good for me. The most important thing is that I tax him out. So it, it's still a victory for me. Because he's not going to get any agenda points. He's going to lose money for nothing. I'll take that any day. Double tearing on a remote is usually very good against most runners. Against K, it's decent until you realize that um, David isn't the only option. Instead of spending David counters, he decided to bring his Gordian Blade out instead. Um, he spent some David counters first before realizing he could make this play. Gordian Blade is extremely effective against stack Turing, stack code gates for that matter. So he walks through my server pretty cheaply, which was a problem. Um, so do ignore the number on the David. He does have 3 counters on David because he chose to not use the David counters after spending them. And you cannot reverse that on Jinteki.net, um, unfortunately. So, for, just take it that there are 3 David counters on David right now. Um, he gets through my server and I think I do not boost the Ash Trace or I do. It was a strength, strength 6 Trace. The main thing I wanted to accomplish here was to... Uh, Yep. Uh, main thing I wanted to accomplish here was to completely bankrupt him. He goes down to 3 credits, which is definitely not an ideal spot to be in, and this um, actually allows me to score the NAPD now if I want to. Or not. It's still not safe to score NAPD right now, but I top deck an Ash. And I think this is where I throw the Ash in and start trying to score the NAPD. Yep, that's exactly what I do. I think that's a very good play right now because he's so poor. He cannot steal an NAPD without playing some sort of money card. And even if he does, he has to beat the Ash Trace when I'm on 18 credits. So this is the problem. When you let HP get away with the credit lead with Eve campaign, uh, he basically let me have an Eve campaign and one tick of Adonis campaign, which uh, paid off big time. You notice that I haven't rest too much ice yet. Um, there's no rest ice on R&D. This is why I have more than enough money to score the NAPD and defend it with Ash. So, yeah. Even though my opponent started with 21 credits on the, on the Turing server run, he basically blew it all away somehow. And this gave me a big scoring window. So this is a problem for my opponent because now I'm on match point. A single foot, global foot initiative would win me the game. But I do have to be vigilant because the double tiering is very very porous against my opponent who now has double prepaid voice pad setup along with 15 credits. Mm, at this point I just need to keep sliding stuff into the remote and hope that he doesn't hammer R&D. But he does and he has a very good weapon against food codes in the form of R&DI. R&DI is very very strong against food codes, especially this version which swaps the toll booth out for two Christian grids. Christian grid is a big problem. Uh, against RNDI because uh, Christian Grid doesn't defend against RNDI. But instead, my opponent chose to make us I into a server he knew had uh, had an upgrade in it. So I'm more than happy to rest the Christian Grid to make him access two less cards, effectively blanking his maker's eye. Which is fine. Um, yeah, it's kind of a fair trade. It does cost me three credits to do so, which is a pain, but it's fine. The other amazing thing about Breaker Bay Grid is that as long as your opponent doesn't trash Breaker Bay Grid, you can keep playing the Never Advance game. Um, every time the server doesn't have an asset in there, you just toss a, a campaign inside or an agenda inside. You're coming out ahead either way. And the best thing is that you can throw Eve and Adonis campaigns inside, not having to worry about um, them hogging up the server. Because when you do have a scoring window and you do need to score something in there, as you saw just now, when I scored the NAPD, I simply chuck the Adonis away. You don't have to worry about losing, uh, coming out behind from resing the Adonis or Eve campaigns because Breaker Bay Grid makes it free to res. So you don't have to worry about trashing the Eve or Adonis when it's time to score. 
<clears throat> as long as you have more campaigns in your hand, which I do, I'm flooded with campaigns this game, you can just play the never advanced game as much as you like, and there's very little your opponent can do about it, short of trashing them from your hand. Um, in the meantime, my opponent continues setting up, ensuring that he always has a lock on my remote, which is probably a good idea. It, on, on my side of the board, the one card I'm looking for is obviously Caprice Nisei. Caprice Nisei is my one ticket to scoring the Blower Food Initiative, and it's a pretty important ticket because I know for a fact that once, if and when my opponent decides to run my remote, I'm done for. I cannot score a Global Food without um, having a Caprice in the remote. So basically, there are only two lines of play here. Either find the Caprice, one of two copies in my deck, three copies if you include archive memories, and uh, the other option is to score two two-pointers. So play the never advanced game, keep sliding agendas in the remote. If he doesn't run them, I score them. But I do have more things to worry about. Uh, over here, I have to worry about R&D digs. That is getting to be a real problem. This is why I have an Ash on the r and I know more or less for a fact that he's not going to run my remote anytime soon, which has an Ash in it. So I'm just going to toss the Ash on the R&D instead and make it such that it's very expensive for him to access. For him to access that server, he had to pay 4 extra credits for the Ash Trace, 3 more to trash the Ash. I'm coming out very far ahead. And the Christian Grid is still stuck on r and I think. I, I'm not sure if that's a Christian Grid. I think it is. Anyway, um, he did trash a Caprice Nisei from the R&D run, but still hasn't found any agendas. A bit unlucky for him, considering that he's seen quite a lot of cards with R&D eye. It's so effective against food codes. He's just getting a bit unlucky. I do have the winning agenda in hand. You see the food there. I'm worried about legwork, but I can't score it yet. It has to stay in my hand. And that is pretty troublesome. I do have an Ichi 1.0 in my hand, and I'm definitely looking to install that on server... Uh, on my remote server sometime soon. That would make it more secure and would give me a greater peace of mind to score uh, my Caprice, I mean my food, global food initiative. Um, yeah, so basically against prepaid kit is about the double assault on the remote and R&D. As long as you can juggle between defending these two, you are usually good. I draw into a cyberdeck fire suite here, and it's pretty useless against my opponent's deck because he runs David instead of Data Sucker. Except that it's not useless at all. I'm going to play the shell game. I'm going to install the cyberdeck fire suite in the remote and pretend that it's an ABT. Will he be baited into running it? If he does, I'm coming out ahead. If he doesn't, well, that's a pity, but at least I get more time to find my Caprice Nisei. Note that the Jackson is still on the board, and yes, I have successfully baited my opponent into the run on a Cyberdex virus suite. Can't complain about that. So, um, he's forced to click through the Ichi, which is a huge waste of time, followed by breaking Turing with Gordian Blade, which isn't that cheap either. It still costs him 5 credits to break 2 Turings, and he has to be an Ash Trace on top of that. Now, I'm not that rich anymore. You notice that Food Coats is very money. Uh, yeah, very money consuming. And I think this is the main Achilles heel of food codes. Every time you get to trash a campaign against food codes as the runner, you're coming out ahead. Never ever second guess yourself. Even though HB's ID is insanely overpowered, even though their ice is mid range and usually uh, affordable to res, even though they have breaker bay grid and lots of campaigns, you have to trash their money. It slows them down so much. Simple as that. I go one step further here. I know I cannot afford to um, lose my, I mean, place the Adonis in the remote server because I know that I need the remote server to score anytime now. I need to be able to score at a moment's notice, basically. Thankfully, my opponent got unlucky again. One in three chance to hit the global foot in my hand, he missed it. And he is relatively poor. Another reason why I decided to just play the Breaker Bay Grid and Adonis naked. It gave him an uh, astrolabe draw, which wasn't very good, but the hope here is that he will not uh, run and trash my Adonis. That is the last thing I want to see. And now it's not so bad because I found the hedge fund, so now I have a pretty good position. All I need is that Caprice Nisei. My R&D is down to, I think, a third of cards left, 
and I still haven't found the archive memories or the second copy of Caprice Nisse that I need. There's one copy in the archives. Problematic, isn't it? Well, yes, the more time you give your opponent by not finding your Caprice Nisse, um, the more time they have to set up and make R&D pokes, which starts losing you the game. I think I did shuffle a Caprice Nisei back to my deck, but he does find one agenda in the form of ABT. That's not something you want to see. We are now on even ground. Well, not really. I'm on. I'm just one agenda away from winning, and it's in my hand, while my opponent is two agendas away from winning. This is quite important. Psychologically, this means that he cannot simply perform a Hail Mary on R&D in hopes of closing out the game. The chances of that happening for him are very low. Whereas, if he does find um, the 6 point in the 3rd agenda, he can easily just run R&D, see 2 cards with R&D eye and have a good shot of winning. So that's pretty dangerous. And here I pulled off a uh, Dave Hoyland. Well, okay, not really. It is protected by 3 pieces of ice, but I do slide the Global Food Initiative into the server. I think it's quite unlikely that he'll decide to run it. Because he knows that I don't really want to score any agenda other than a global food. Besides, he's going for the R&D dig anyway. Which is usually what kids do. Why would you bother playing the Ash and Caprice games when you can just go for Maker's Eye instead? And this is why R&D defense is so crucial against prepaid K. Um, I can't do much honestly. The double E line on R&D is pretty bad. Against Kate, you really really want the big sentries, the Assassin, the Ichi 2 which is in my hand. Most of your other eyes is pretty useless. Ichi 1 is also decent. Eli 1 is bad. <laughs> um, his dog waltzes through it and he finds the third agenda. Now this, yes, this is where it gets really dicey because I am one R&D dig away from losing and I cannot afford to lose a shell game on the remote. This is not why you want to be as food codes, but I know I do have the agenda there, so I go for it. Now the game ends off in a very anticlimactic way, <laughs> sorry to you viewers, but basically what happens is that my opponent did not notice that I double advanced the card in the remote. Uh, so he didn't run it, and obviously I won off the back of it. Had he known, and had he gone for it, he would have easily won, because all I had were two Ichis, an Ichi 2 and an Ichi 1, on top of two, two Turing's, but there were no defensive upgrades in the remote. Remember that the upgrade in the remote was actually a cyberdex that he accessed earlier but decided not to trash. He could easily just let all the Ichis fire and get through the double tiering with a David fetch from clone chip. He would have won the game. I was taking a very big risk there and I, uh, that is where Ichis really let me down because against someone who runs clone chip, they can easily just recur the breakers they need and get through the server. You need the defensive upgrades. So it really did seem like my opponent should have won that game, and indeed I think he would have um, had he saw that advanced card. Um, he was locking my R&D pretty hard, got getting quite a few mega sites off, but more importantly locking it with R&D I, and he had a lot of money to challenge my remote. So what were the the things that were causing a lot of problems for me? Firstly, he was actually doing a decent job of controlling my money. He wasn't 100% uh, on top of it, you can't really deny all of HBZ Con, but I think he managed to trash 2 or 3 campaigns out of the 5 that I rest throughout the game. You can never have too many campaigns as HB. I mean 3 Adonises and 3 E sounds like overkill, but I used 5 of them throughout the entire game because that's how money hungry food codes is. Um, the more you can uh, burn their campaigns, the more you can slow them down, and that's really key. Um, had my opponent decided to trash the Ad Adonis with Breaker Bay Grid in the side server, I think he would actually have had a much more convincing victory, because I was on very few credits towards the end of the game. Secondly, I didn't want to see Jackson trash, which my opponent didn't really attempt to force. I think my Jackson was... Uh, popped because he was making an R&D run and I needed to elevate agenda density. Uh, so I shuffled three non-agendas back into R&D. But generally, generally you really want to force the Jackson out of food codes because um, with Jackson I can find all the combo pieces I need uh, uh, much quicker, quicker. Be they the Caprice Nise, the Ash, the Capri uh, the Chrisium Grid, important pieces of ice like I Ichi, or 
just the global food initiative that you need to close out the game. In this game, I if had I actually found a Caprice this game, I would have said Jackson did a lot of work because being able to draw so many cards to find your Caprice means that you can accelerate your victory. Even though I say that as food codes you want uh, to capitalize on the mid game, you do languish in the late game where the opponent is set up and they can access many cards out of R&D. So you do want to rush out agendas while the opportunity is there. Finally, R&D interface is horrible as a food codes player because Christian doesn't defend against it. Basically, your only real defense is Caprice. Secondarily, Ash. You can't afford to stack too much ice on R&D because Kate gets through most ice for cheap and it gets exponentially more expensive to install each new piece of ice. Installing two Eli's on R&D was probably a mistake. I should have used ice that wasn't dirt cheap to um, break with dog. So that's the food codes game. Still learning how to play food codes optimally, but no doubt it's a very strong deck that can hold its own even against the tier 1 prepaid kit. Thanks for watching, happy net running, goodbye.